After my freshman year in college, I lived for two months in a rural highland village in Tanzania near the Serengeti. And each morning, two friends and I would run to the top of this hill that overlooked our valley, and the villagers thought that we were pretty weird to do this, because in Swahili, there's a word pole, which means I'm sorry. And then there's a phrase pole pole, which means go slowly. And as we'd run past them, the villagers would yell, pole, pole. And we couldn't tell if they wanted us to slow down or if they just felt bad for us. <laughs> in either case, the villagers would walk up to me in the market and say, Liz, what could you possibly have been running from that morning? Certainly the hyenas didn't come out at that time of the day. And I'd sort of smile and shake my head and tell them that no, I wasn't running from hyenas or from anything at all, because I don't run from things. I run for things. Now, I was born in rural China and left on a street corner by my birth parents in the hopes of a better life. The orphanage that found and took me in did their best, but underfunding led to my malnourishment, whose lasting effects always remind me of where I came from. After 11 months in my orphanage, I was adopted by the most extraordinary woman, my mom. And my mom was a radiance in the world for our little family of two. She was snarky and bright. She loved nature and adventure and life and people. She had this deep, beautiful laugh. She was resilient. And that resilience held true when I was 15 and my mom was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. I remember my mom coming home from work that day. There was a distant look in her eyes. Her voice cracked like it never did and she sat me down on the couch to tell me the news. We ended up crying on that couch for so long that I missed cross-country practice and we both forgot to cook and eat dinner. From then on, my life revolved around my mom and my running. I became my mom's caretaker and homemaker. I took care of the family business, and I still went to cross country and track practice every day because even if I wanted to spend all that time with my mom, she knew how important my running was to me, and she told me that I had to embrace my own life too. From then on, I realized that as my mom's health began to deteriorate, that we were also in deep medical debt without income because she was too sick to work. And so I reached out to my local running club and tried to organize a sort of fundraiser. You know, I thought it would be a simple thing, a little run around the town, some food afterwards, and the chance to hand me some pocket change as everyone left. But instead, over 200 people showed up to the run that night. So many, I had to stand up on this ridiculous ladder and address them all before we got started. And I left a couple hours later with over $13,000 in my hands. And I left so excited to show my mom. And so I went straight to the hospital where she had been for the past two days after suffering a respiratory shutdown. And I walked into her hospital room and held all this cash in my hand. She smiled, told me she was so proud of me, but not because of what was in my hands. My mom was an accountant and she knew the importance of the money but she didn't care about that tangible gift nearly as much as the intangible. The fact that that night, all those people had run for me and for my mom, and that they would have our backs again if things ever went south. About a month later, my mom came home from the hospital to hospice care. Naturally, I went to cross-country practice, seeking the catharsis and the perspective that running always gives me because when I run, my brain turns off. There are no thoughts, it's just the cadence of my feet. And when I run with a buddy and I inevitably talk to them, my brain turns back on just a smidge, it gives me this tunnel vision. So that as my friend and I run side by side in sync and our eyes are trained forward to whatever we're running towards, I can be completely engrossed in whatever we're talking about. And so that night at practice, I found myself running with my teammate, Caitlin who had been my running buddy many times over since my mom's diagnosis. But despite all the times that Caitlin and I had talked about what was going on in my life, it took me three whole miles to admit to her that my mom was in hospice care. And when I did, I realized that the world seemed cruel and unfair and that I was fed up with trying. And then Caitlin stopped running completely. She messed up our cadence. She averted her eyes from our forward goal and looked into mine and told me point blank, to snap out of it. And there was no malice in her voice, no misunderstanding, because Caitlin knew me. She knew that in the depths of my tunnel vision brain, I needed something abrupt and honest and true to restore the perspective that I want to live my life by. 
as we started running again, she told me that I couldn't give up, certainly not after everything I'd already been through. And maybe it was the lack of oxygen getting to my head from all that running, but I listened hard. And as we carried on with the run, I stopped looking at the grounds and started looking ahead again. I went home from practice that night, and I cooked dinner. I sat by my mom's bedside and ate. She was too sick to eat, and her eyes were closed, but she still managed to laugh that beautiful, deep laugh when I told her the whimsical details of my day at school. And the next day, I remember it was a Wednesday. I was driving to practice when something made me stop. My fingers tingled as if they were caffeinated. It was the same jittery feeling I get before a big race. And so I turned the car around. I drove back home, and with those tingling fingers, I held my mom's hand as she passed away. My coach knew what my absence at practice meant. The only other time I'd missed practice was when we found out about her diagnosis. And so he told the team during their cool-down run. They all showed up to my house that evening, and three days later, I raced alongside them. And in the aftermath of my mom's death, I felt lost. If not for my team, I don't know what would have happened. And then that running family became a true family when I turned 18 and my coach unofficially adopted me. I went from Liz, this poor girl who was twice orphaned, to Liz, this insanely lucky girl who was twice adopted. I had two parents and three siblings. There was my sister Caroline, the sweet sister, the tough runner with a great sense of style, and there's my big brother Clay, the down-to-earth adventurer and the handyman. And the coolest thing was that I got to not only be a sister, but a big sister because then there's my little brother, David. And now David, he wasn't a runner like the rest of us in the family were because he figured out a long time ago that he just didn't want to be. And David never spent his time doing things that he didn't want to do. He was goofy and stubborn in this way. And he was also only 14 when he was diagnosed with a rare, aggressive childhood cancer. I remember walking down the staircase after class my dad called me about David. And I picked up the phone and had to sit down halfway down the staircase and cradle my head in my hands as I tried to understand what he was telling me. My dad said that we would be moving to Memphis, Tennessee for David to be treated at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, one of the only places in the world conducting a clinical trial on his type of cancer. My dad said that our new routine will revolve around David's daily treatments and hospital visits. And as he told me all these things, I couldn't help but think that like my mom's diagnosis, I wasn't and would never be prepared to hear something like this. But unlike my mom's diagnosis, this time the life on the line was so young, I felt like cancer and tragedy were chasing me, chasing this incredible family that had taken me in, and I wanted to run away from it all. But I couldn't run away because David never did. David was a fighter. He never pitied himself. He took his fight day by day, focused his energy on the people that he loved and the little moments of joy that made him happy. He'd spend hours laughing hysterically with his friends while playing video games, or he'd come cozy up on the couch with me to watch a movie, surprise tickle attack me, and then conclude with a hug because you can never get annoyed at David after one of his hugs. And even as his health began to deteriorate, David told my sister that he, this kid who refused to run, wanted to give it a try. And then on April 10th, 2017, David passed away, holding the hands of his two parents and his three siblings. In the aftermath of David's death, I resented Memphis for being the place that I was forced to move to for such a horrible reason, and I resented it for being the place that David had died until I experienced Memphis's running community at its best, which is the St. Jude Marathon weekends. It happens right after Thanksgiving every year. Because in Memphis, people rally behind St. Jude's. They rally because St. Jude's provides its incredible care for free, and they rally by running. Thus, every year, rather than Thanksgiving, my family and I congregate in Memphis for the St. Jude Marathon weekend with our extended family of runners, all under the banner of Team David. Last year alone on race day, people raised $10 million for the hospital. Team David contributed 100,000 of that 
and we aim only to grow. And so when I stood on those Memphis streets, amid 26,500 runners and 40,000 spectators, I realized that people there were not there to run from tragedy, but to run for a purpose. I think of David himself, who couldn't run when he was sick, but still stood on those Memphis streets in his, his beanie, so proud to cheer on his family. I think of one of David's best friends, this macho football player who's now committed to running the half marathon. I think of my older brother, who ran the marathon without training, or my sister who won the half marathon. And I even think of myself a little bit because I was injured and still managed to run the 5K. And I did so because I don't care how far or how fast that I run, I care about why. And because of all this, Memphis is now home to me. And the St. Jude Marathon weekend is both a family tradition and a personal pilgrimage. Because I will race, be it the marathon in my mid-20s, or walking the 5K when I'm 80, as far into the future as my legs will carry me. Today is November 10th, 2018. It's been 1,879 days since I last held my mom's hand. And it has been 579 days since I last held David's. I'm now a senior at Harvard University I've served as women's captain of the Harvard College Running Club. I've had a campus job leading runs for students and staff around the greater Boston area. And I'm currently training for Team David's fourth consecutive showing at the St. Jude Marathon weekend this December. And when I look back on my life, up till now there are things that I want to run from, but I chose and I still choose not to run from things because I refuse to let this life of mine be defined by my circumstances rather than by my choices. I choose to run for things. I run for my birth parents in China who risked their livelihoods to give me a chance at this new life. I run for my mom who taught me to love nature and adventure and life and people. I run for my family who showed me what family truly means and who gave me hope when I felt lost. And of course, I run for David who showed me how to love the people that I love and how to embrace the little joys in life that make life so good. Now this life has been and will continue to be full of runs. Thank you all for joining me for a couple of miles.